I just want to say um, how honored I am to be here to, and um, privileged to give an update on our recent findings on the prevalence of autism here in Wisconsin and nationally. I think I gave, I presented our early prevalence findings at one of the first uh, days with the experts back in the early 2000s. And so much has changed um, since then. It's and just in the way we think about autism and talk about autism. Um, also, I remember learning at that day with the experts, I thought I was being brought in as an expert in autism, only to learn that the real experts on this day with the expert are, are individuals living with autism and their family members. And I learned so much from that experience. And I, I Really happy to see this uh, tradition continuing. Um, I would like to acknowledge that the work I'm going to present uh, today is not just my own. I'm part of a um, large teams, multi-site teams of uh, researchers across the country here at the Weissman Center. Um, and those are named at the top who are currently working on these projects on the um, Autism and Developmental Disabilities Monitoring Network, and also the uh, study to explore early development in autism. Both of these are funded by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta. So um, I also just want to acknowledge that I'm an epidemiologist and um, study the epidemiology of autism, which is um, defined as the study of the frequency and the distribution of autism in populations. And um, we use this information both to sort of monitor the trends in the population, identify public health priorities, and understand the impacts of autism. Also, we study health disparities related to autism, the need for services, um, and, and then we can use the information collected also to explore the causes of autism and the factors that are associated with increased prevalence. Um, we do longitudinal studies to look at the changes over the life course in autism. And um, ultimately, we can use this information to evaluate the effectiveness and the cost effectiveness of different uh, treatments and also inform public policy. So that's sort of the importance of doing epidemiologic studies uh, of autism and why we do it. Um, but in order to do this work, we have to categorize the condition that we're studying as either a case or not a case. And for these studies of autism, we, we use the DSM-5 uh, criteria currently, which defines autism as a, at autism spectrum disorder, as a persistent deficits in social communication and social interaction, accompanied by repetitive behaviors. And we'll hear much more about this later um, um, in, in the program this morning of how it's defined. Um, but I just would say that um, there's, there's controversy now, and, and, and this is why so much has changed the way we talk. Not everyone thinks of autism as a disorder. And so I just want to acknowledge that in, 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 autism, in, in epidemiology, we categorize cases and we use this, this approach. Let me see. Um, now, just from a historical perspective, the first epidemiologic study of autism done in our country was done here in the state of Wisconsin. It was actually the second epidemiologic study of autism done anywhere. The first was in England in the 1960s. And Daryl Trefford did a similar study here in Wisconsin where he collected data in the 1960s and then um, um, used it to, he went around the entire state to identify all the children in the age range of three to 12 years who met criteria at the time for autism. And he found a total of 280 cases and calculated that the prevalence of autism was about 3.1 per, per 10,000 children, or in other words, one in over 3,000 children in our state were affected by autism at that time. Uh, he also noted the, um, Sex ratio, which is a you know the ratio of boys to girls is is over three over three times three boys for every girl identified with autism and and reported many other things about the um, characteristics of autism, but that's just um, that was then in the 1960s autism was thought to be extremely rare and so it wasn't didn't really rise to be a public health concern. Uh, CDC wouldn't have been doing studies of autism at that time, um, but what happened in the 1990s is that Based on uh, the number of children receiving services in schools and other data, it looked like the prevalence of autism was increasing dramatically. And these are data from the state of Wisconsin showing that in 19, 
uh, 92, the first year, only 20 children were identified in schools as having autism. And then each year over time, it increased dramatically um, up to 2008, shown on this slide, but it's continued to increase even more. So if we compare these numbers to the numbers, Treffer, you know, 280 children in the, in the 1960s to the age range is wider here, but even if we take half of this number in that age range, it's over 6,000 would be identified today. Um, and it's interesting that um, you'd think that maybe we have more children now, but it's not true. There are almost 20% fewer children in Wisconsin at school age children today than there were in the 1960s when they identified a total of two on 280. So these numbers are even more dramatic than that. Um, so seeing these numbers and lots of public concern, um, in the year 2000, the Children's Health Congress passed the Children's Health Act, which called on the CDC to begin actually monitoring the prevalence of autism. We can't just rely on the school data because it wasn't systematically collected in a way that you could need to do for an epidemiologic study. So they launched the um, Autism and Developmental Disabilities Monitoring Network, which monitors the prevalence began monitoring uh, among eight-year-old children, beginning in the year 2000, looking retrospectively in sites across the country. And we are uh, one of the sites here in Wisconsin participating in this. So over time, and this, what's shown here is since from the year 2000 to 2020, you can see that the number, the prevalence in the population has continued to increase over this time. So when I presented earlier here in, the, maybe it was 2006 or so, it was fewer than 10 children um, per, per, per thousand or a little less than 1%. And now it's continued to increase so that it's well over 2% of children meeting uh, diagnostic criteria for an autism spectrum disorder. Um, the Lots of change over time, but during most of this period, there was no change in the methodology or the diagnostic criteria for autism, although in 2013, the, the criteria did change and there was uh, expectation that the prevalence would actually decrease because of the, this def, definitional changes in autism, but it hasn't. It's continued to increase over time, even to, uh, despite that. These are the same data really just shown by the numbers. So when, when we, oh, from 2000 down to 2020, we, we can call, describe the prevalence as either the number per thousand or the percent of children, or we can say, how many, uh, one in how many children. So over time, when we first started doing this, it was a one in 150 children were identified with autism. And our most recent data, it's one in 36. So it's just another way of showing how the numbers have changed. And you could, the other thing I just wanna point out here is this total number of 42, over 42,000 children with autism, eight-year-old children. This makes the Adam Network one of the largest studies out there. Um, of, for studying autism in general. And we have um, doctoral students here at the Weisman Center and across the country doing lots of different analyses of these um, data to uh, get a better understanding of autism. These again show the, the same data from 2000 to 2020 stratified by boys and girls. And you can see this the same um, ratio of the prevalence in boys as being you know, three to four, almost five times some years higher in boys than girls. So this is something that's just persistent in the epidemiology of autism. We don't really fully understand uh, why it is. Um, so just a few words on what, some possible explanations for this increase in autism. We show the data, we don't necessarily have an answer of what, what's behind it. But clearly one of the reasons is um, the expansion uh, of the diagnostic criteria for autism It used to, in when Daryl Treffer did his work, it was a very narrow definition and it's, it's expanded to be thought of more of a, as a spectrum. Um, and so that just that alone could be what's behind this change in prevalence. And also, you know, it, it, why we had only 20 children in 1992 identified with autism in schools, that was the first year that it was a reporting category. So it's not that it didn't exist before that, it just wasn't recognized or, or treated in the school systems. And what we've seen is a gradual adoption every year uh, of that category for reporting and providing services. There's also been incredibly um, increase, huge increases in the awareness of autism in the population. We have more training um, 
of professionals to diagnosis. We do routine screening and um, more treatments options available leading to more identification. So these are all part of what's behind the rise. I think there's also been changes in the diagnostic practices. Um, we have universal screening now for autism in all child, well child visits. So that's gonna bring, right, it lead to increases in the numbers. Um, um, there's something called diagnostic accretion, which is children can have multiple diagnoses. There used to be, if you had Down syndrome, you weren't even evaluated for autism. Now, almost any disability, you can also be evaluated for autism. So you can have multiple diagnoses that could be contributing. And then um, there's something called diagnostic substitution, um, which I'll point out in a second. But then apart from all those, there could be increases in factors that do contribute to increased numbers of children with autism, like environmental risk factors, uh, other perinatal factors. We, we can't rule those out as well. Um, on diagnostic substitution, that's the idea that things we used to call something else, we now call autism. And there's some evidence of that. These are data from the state of Wisconsin from our school system uh, from 1997 through, 19, through 2016. And in yellow, it's the number of children classified as having autism. And in, in red, it's the number classified as having intellectual disability as their primary disability. And at the same time that autism is rising, the intellectual disability is declining. And it could be just that we're more sophisticated measures and more uh, refinement of, of the identification of children. And that could be contributing to this as well. Um, I mentioned uh, factors that are associated with increased prevalence other than all those reasons could be that um, there's, there's increased risk in the, in the population for ha developing autism. And one of the factors we have identified in our research is preterm birth and low birth weight. Um, children born preterm are at, at greatly increased risk of developing autism. They don't all develop it, but they have a higher prevalence than others. And those children are surviving much more than they did back in the 1960s. So that could be the one factor contributing. The other thing, uh, we've identified birth spacing and birth order as, as factors, but also advanced parental age. There's been a huge change since the 1960s in the age of parenting, and especially the age of the first child. So uh, children who are the firstborn to parents that are over, or the mother is over 35, or the father is over 40 at, at the time of birth, they have like an, and if they're male, they have an eight times likelihood, more likelihood of developing autism than other children. So, and these things have changed over time. So they could be, the, the age of parenting has changed and this could be contributing as well to the rise in prevalence. Um, another thing I just wanna point out in, in our studies of autism, we've found that um, there's been a change in that the rise in prevalence is not, if we stratify, um, children with autism as having more or less functional limitations and adaptive behavior problems. Um, we can classify them as having severe functional limitations, mild or none. And you can see that the lower, uh, darker bar, bar at the bottom is the proportion is, is really, it shows the, the prevalence with severe functional limitations. That prevalence has not increased over time. If, and, and these are very preliminary findings. Um, one of our doctoral students, Sarah Farnier, is, is actually working on this at, in her dissertation for doing it throughout the entire period, two, 2000 to 2020. It'll be a much more definitive study. But it, all indications are that the rise in prevalence that we've seen over time is in the more mildly affected um, in terms of their fun functional limitations. Now, I want to say just a word about socioeconomic status and the prevalence of autism, because this idea has been around since the first descriptions by Leo Connor of autism in the 1940s, where he described autism as something that mainly affects children from affluent families. And he just, and, and this so it was kind of a myth that was perpetuated in the, in the clinical studies of autism over the decades. Um, and it, and, and it really um, was kind of debunked beginning in the 1980s by Lorna Wing, who said, no, it's not that ch wealthy families are more likely to have children with autism. It's just that it takes a lot of resources to get a diagnosis. <laughs> and so we, nobody really looked at this 
it was kind of debunked as an idea, but we, using our surveillance data from Wisconsin, we've, we were provoked to, hey, is it true that that autism is more prevalent in higher income families. And we did find this sort of almost a dose response relationship with higher the income, the more li likely the child develops autism. And this kind of shook up the epidemiologic world like, no, we didn't think that was true, but we, we looked at it using our national data from all of the ADAM sites across the country, the Autism and Developmental Disabilities Monitoring Network. And basically what we found from these data go from 2002 to 2010. Over time, every year, the prevalence was highest in the higher economic strata and lowest in the low economic strata. And um, coincidentally, during the same period, 2002 to 2010, the prevalence was higher in white children than in uh, black or Hispanic children. This was a persistent finding during that period. We published this widely and talked about it. This kind of led to increased awareness that, wait, maybe are we under-identifying autism in, in um, children of color or in, in under, underrepresented groups, um, economically disadvantaged groups? CDC and others went on major uh, information campaigns and um, screening to to sort of diversify the media attention to autism and 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 raise awareness of it. And um, we have in our state the uh, Learn the Science Act Early site. Every state has one. Um, this also promotes the idea of early identification and awareness uh, of autism in the population generally. And um, these are some more of the media images. You can see over time, earlier it was one in 54 at one point, our most recent data, one in 36. The CDC and others are also trying to do more to um, promote information in different languages, in Spanish and other languages, to increase awareness and identification of autism in all children. This is kind of hard to follow, but what our most recent surveillance years are 2018 and 2020. And what we've done in, is show, even if we just look at this, total column on the right, that prevalent, the increasing prevalence with increasing socioeconomic status has disappeared in our data. In fact, it, it's more, it's a little bit higher. The, the lowest prevalence, little bit, is in the higher income groups now, which fits more with what the epidemiology of developmental disabilities in general is more like that. If it's associated with SES, social class, it tends to be higher in the lower social class. And so it, we've kind of fixed this uh, under identification, I think, maybe. Um, also, uh, recently, you can see that the trend in prevalence by race and ethnicity has also changed, where it's now um, higher, highest in Hispanic children, nationally followed by black, and then white children have the lowest prevalence. So this is trying to track that change. In Wisconsin, these are the data. We, the, the prevalence in Hispanic children is now the highest in our state. It's, it's dramatically risen. Uh, there's still a little bit of disparity between black and white children. Um, just, uh, I don't, I don't want to have take too much time, but a, a few other key findings. The Adam Network has expanded to include monitoring of prevalence in four-year-old children as well, and also in, at age 16. And one of the things we're finding with four-year-old children is over time, the in the age at which children are being identified with autism is lower, is decreasing over time, and that's kind of shown on the left. On the right, we're also looking at co-occurring. Uh, we're looking at adolescence, how kids are doing at age 16. And we've been finding um, very high prevalence of ADHD, anxiety, depression, epilepsy, um, obsessive compulsive. These are co-occurring conditions, extremely prevalent in, in children with autism and, and adolescents. Suicidality is 10% of children with autism reporting this. Now, these data don't have a comparison group, so I'd, I can't say how this compares to children without autism, but it's hot. From all indications, it's much more uh, prevalent. It's telling us something here that maybe we need to be doing more when we identify children with autism at younger ages to address this, um, this epidemic. Um, also, we've been doing studies of the impacts of the COVID pandemic on uh, families and children with autism. We saw in the Adam Network a big drop during uh, 2020 in the access to early identification and developmental assessments. And then in our SEED study, we actually have looked at the economic impacts on families of children with autism. We found that families with a child with autism were more likely to experience employment reductions during the pandemic than other families. They were less able to 
uh, do remote work, considerably less than other families, and you can imagine reasons for that. Um, and they reported more difficulty paying bills and fear of losing their home, those kind of impacts. So that tells us something. We have to address the um, special needs of families in public health emergencies in the future. Um, so just in conclusion, um, we have found that um, the prevalence of autism has continued to increase over time. It's now affecting more than 2% of children in the United States. Um, and given the high cost of autism, it's the most expensive form of special education. And the early intervention services for autism are also very expensive. So this rising prevalence has huge implications. And I think our healthcare system is not really, uh, really ready to ha handle the increasing numbers of children uh, with autism, especially those who don't have very uh, coming from affluent families. <laughs> so this is really a a call for um, much more work and much more resources in this area. Um, and then we need to go do ongoing monitoring um, to really understand better what's going on with the prevalence of autism in the population. So with that, I think we're going to have questions later, maybe. So I'll, uh, I'm happy to answer any if, if we have time, but otherwise I would turn it to uh, Dr. Lee. Thank you. We have time for a couple of questions. Uh, Emily will come over and grab you over there with a the microphone. Yeah, so this year's INSAR conference in Stockholm, Sweden, it was mentioned by various researchers that various, um, various ratios of diagnosis with autism after a, uh, an inch, after a study that was shared um, are different among adult demographics versus child demographics. Has the Wiseman Center done anything to to study whether or not certain diagnostic ratios change throughout the lifespan? Yes, I. I the only work that I can really speak to myself is this up that we followed up to age sixteen, and there's changes there. But there are many other experts at the Wiseman Center who do this work. Um, Dr. DeWalt is here who really studies the transition to adulthood and how that changes. But I think what we have here is a new cohort. The, the longitudinal studies from the past were studying that very tiny fraction of individuals who identified with autism. And, and then they have been followed. And um, Marsha Malik, the former director of the Weissman Center, has really pioneered this work of fo following children into in, throughout the life course. Um, but we have different children now that being identified with autism and the studies haven't, they're just beginning for that cohort. So, thank you. But I'm sure they're different. And, and they're different. The sex ratio could be changing as well during that, during that time. I was wondering if there was any um, ongoing uh, variation of people that have different intense intellectual levels for the parents like intellectually what's the difference between those not based on income but based on intellectual levels causing specific autistic traits do you mean the intellectual level of the parents yes and then the offspring mm -hmm. yeah i mean it was it, it was Part of that idea that, you know, it's something about the parents being highly intelligent that then increases the risk of autism in the children. I don't think we're seeing that. Um, there's been studies of occupation, too, that, that certain occupations of parents increase the risk of autism in the child, whether they work in the tech industry and things like that. It's possible that um, parents of children with autism sometimes are on the spectrum themselves, and then if... This is another theory out there for the rise in prevalence, is that um, perhaps in the past, two parents on the spectrum wouldn't have met each other and, 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 and had a child together. But now with the internet or the types of work in the tech industry and things like that, they, they are more likely. And that could be contributing to the increased prevalence. But we don't, we don't, I, don't I haven't seen firm evidence of, the, of this. Good question, though. Thank you. One last question. Uh, 
Okay. Was, was there someone that had a, a question? Oh yeah, go ahead. Oh, yep, that'd be the I thought you question. had a question. Thank you for the information today. I just have a question. Uh, when you talk about functional limitations, uh, you show a graph like uh, how severe is the limitation in eight year old, eight year old uh, child. I wonder, do you fa are you factoring or is this study factoring uh, treatment that the kids might be have might uh -huh. be receiving? Very good question. Now, I mean, those data, no, because we don't have good information in our surveillance system about the treatment that they did get and when they got it. But it's a really good question because I think that, um, that those measures change dramatically after children do receive services. And one of the things, when speaking of the intelligence quotient, one of the things we've seen over time is that the proportion of children with autism with co-occurring intellectual disability is declining over time as well. And we think this could be partly that the interventions that children get now do boost IQ dramatically. And so that's a good question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maureen.